Grab your Bible. We're going to go right into the Word of God. We're going to start in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 9. And if you don't have a physical Bible, we have... Thanks, bro. Tim Hawkins, ladies and gentlemen, the best. This might be the one I wanted. We'll see. All right, man. Good to have backups and good to have friends. (laughs) So Matthew uh, chapter 9 and verse 37 where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and this is what we get in the Bible. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay, wait, let me just get myself organized. It's like a tornado hit up here, and uh, I think that was me or a demon. I don't know. Okay, so uh, this is Jesus. He's speaking kind of in a metaphor when he's talking about the harvest. He's talking about people who are ready to come to God. And he's, when he's pr- telling us to pray for laborers, he's telling us to pray that God would send people to talk to the people who are ready to come to God. So that's what this is about. Now, my message today is part of our series called Giant Steps. And it's, this message is prompted because some stories I've heard of things happening in our church. These are recent stories. They all have a particular need in common, and it is this need that is motivating me to preach this message on this topic today. So here are a couple of stories, and you'll see why I wanted to preach on this topic today. In this first story, there's a, there's a guy in our church, young guy, really solid, he recently got saved. He received Jesus as a Savior. He's, he's growing in the Lord, and he's finding that now with Jesus, he has some really powerful strength in his life to deal with some tough times that he's facing. And he's doing this with a kind of grace that's awesome to see, so much so that one of his friends noticed and said, man, there's something different about you. There's something rare in you, this combination of peace and power while you're going through this really bad stuff. He says, I want to find out what you've got going on. Will you come over? Oh, can I come over and will you explain to me what's going on? So this guy's like, yeah, sure, come on over. I'll talk to you about this. And so this friend's on his way over and this man calls Pastor Tim who just ran up here with my notes and um, he calls him up and he says, hey, my, my friend's coming over and... I think he's going to want to receive Jesus as his Savior. What do I say? I don't know what to say to him. What do I say? So Tim tells him, well, here's what you say. And he gives the thing I'm about to say to you. And this man, this man says, oh, thanks, Tim. He hangs up. Two hours later, Tim gets a call back. And it's this guy saying, hey, Tim, I just want you to know that my friend just, to, just prayed to receive Jesus as a Savior. Okay. This is just super cool. It's the kind of stuff that God keeps doing here at Pathway Church. And story number two, there's a leader also on our worship team. So Tim is multiple times a hero today. Um, Calls Tim, and he's got the same question, only this time he's literally, he's on a job site. He's like, Tim, I've got a friend. I've been talking to him, and he's just hungry. He wants to receive Jesus. What do I say? So Tim starts telling him what to say, and this guy's like, hold on, wait a minute. And he goes, hey, Joe, Tim hears this in the background. Hey, Joe, come over here. Uh, Tim's going to explain it to you. He puts Tim <laughs> on speakerphone, and there's the sound of a job site going on. And um, to, I mean, basically, this guy prays right there on the phone with Tim to receive Jesus as his Savior. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> Why is this cool? Every single week we see this. Jesus actually said that every time even one person meets Jesus, that heaven rejoices, which means that they just threw a couple of parties up there, which that's a party I want to be at. Take your time, Lord. But that's a party that I want to be at. Okay. But that's not all. I mean, I've I've just given you two snippets of something that's happening every week, multiple times, so much so that when we have our staff meetings as a church, we're hearing these stories from every corner and all different ages, and it's going on. And when we go out as leaders of Pathway Church, and we're talking to leaders in other churches or in our denomination, which is the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and we're, we tell them some of these stories, they think we're making it up. And we're not making it up. It is something remarkable. It is something beautiful. It's super cool. 
And I will tell you what I think is the main reason why it's happening so, awesome, so often here, and that is because we have gone out and collectively prayed over 63,000 homes in our community. And add that to the fact that we are right now praying for hundreds and hundreds of names. If you saw these little dots around the walls and the entrances with names on them to get saved. And we are praying for people to get saved. And because Jesus said to pray to the Lord of the harvest. And we prayed. And because God is answering literally thousands and thousands of prayer prayers plus because the Bible says that the gospel is the power, it is the muscle of God that results in salvation. And it's not that we're really creative or inventive in presenting the gospel. We're just dumb enough to present it. And that is the power of God. So there's not a day that goes by without somebody at our church saying to somebody else, hey, welcome to God's family every single day, and God gets all the glory for all of it because he's the one who saves. Amen? All right. Some of you are not amening. It's all right. And now, it seems as if for the last 30 years, I want to check something here. Uh, yeah. No, you guys just meditate. I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, okay, this is a good one. Um, it seems as if for the last 30 years, the tide of spiritual interest has been flowing out, and people are like, shut down, they're like, I'm not interested, don't talk to me about God or Jesus or anything like that. That's been pretty much the case for, I'd say, 30 years. However, there are a lot of people saying that's about to change, and we're seeing some signs that God is awakening actually a spiritual hunger in our world today in ways that, that has not been over the last little while. Uh, I've told you before that every single day, people are going to Google and they're typing in the words, is God real? They're asking St. Google, is God real? And they're actually asking that question at a rate of 200 times every second. 200 times per second. So 180,000 people, by the time this church service is over, will have asked Google if God is real. And the answer that Google gives them, you know how Google gives you websites to go to? I've done this several times now, and all the websites that are at the top of the list are actually solid. They're good. I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised. However, above those websites, Google puts what they call a snippet view. And in that snip, so this is before you even get to the first website. Google says, there has never been definitive proof for the existence of God. So Google is answering the question before anybody clicks a link. Is God real? But So who needs Google when they have you and me, right? Let's get out there. Now, studies show that 60%, this is new. The thing that your people in your life who do, don't go to church, aren't interested in God, aren't interested in Jesus, 60% of these people are open or very open to having a conversation with you about faith. 60%, that's a majority, that's new, that's a change. So what I want to do in this message is to equip you. I want to give you what you need to explain the way of salvation to a friend and to actually tie the knot. And I want to show you that we have two resources or tools for you to do this. So here we go. The title of my talk today is Step Up to Sharing the Gospel, part of the Giant Steps series, Step Up to Sharing the Gospel. So I'm going to give you a who, a, a how, and a what when it comes to doing this thing, all right? Even if you've never done it before, or even if you're like, what, what are you even talking about? What's the gospel? Here we go. All right, so we're going to start with the who. Whose job is it to share the gospel? According to the Bible, every believer has been sent by Jesus into a mission field uniquely designed for you. Where you are right now is on purpose. God has a plan for you to be to them a missionary. There are people who will hear you talk about Jesus who will never in a million years come and hear me. And also, the way you talk about God, the way, what you bring to the table, your experiences, your personality, uh, the stuff you're interested in, the stuff you do, even the stuff where you've messed up and blown it and you're embarrassed and all that, all of that makes you the very best person to reach a certain segment of people that no one else can reach but you. God has you in a place for a reason. Now, 
you might have messed up and gotten to this place. God's going to deliver you from it. But while you're there, you've got some good news to share. So who is it that preaches the gospel? Every believer. In fact, the Bible teaches that every single Christian is a minister. Not just me and the people who get you know, a salary from it. You are a minister. You are a priest. You are a witness. You are a missionary. You are an ambassador. You are a living letter written by God to the world. You are God's communication vehicle to the world. You know who is? You are. I'm talking to you about you. When we talk about the church, we talk about the church gathered, the church scattered. Right now, we are gathered. This is to worship. This is to get instructed. This is like the halftime talk. This is to get briefed, mobilized, equipped, motivated to go out. So we're the church gathered, and this is what we're doing right now. But once, you know, we finish our service, great God, we go out the door, we leave this place. And that moment, we're still the church, only now we're the church scattered. Every school, every business, every neighborhood, every agency, every team, every classroom, the church scatters so that all throughout this community and our world, there are people who have become agents of grace and truth inside a culture of confusion and pain. We are the church gathered and scattered. And this task of sharing the gospel is not just for pastors and preachers. It's not just for, you know, evangelists and all of that. It's for us all. That's the who. And I'm talking about you and me and all of us. All right. Now, let's go to the how. How does this happen? Uh, We share the gospel the same way Jesus shared the gospel. Okay, so that's the plan. And it's how the apostles did it. It's how the early Christians did it, and there are two primary ways. Normal conversations that just lead to spiritual things. So you're just hanging out with your friends, and suddenly you find yourself in a conversation about God, heaven, Jesus, salvation, all of that. This is awesome. This is beautiful. This is called friendship evangelism. It's called lifestyle evangelism. It's been around as a a thing for, say, around 30, 35, 40 years Because prior to that, when I grew up in a church, and a lot of you have had the same experience, we were sent out to talk to strangers about Jesus. I mean, I remember in junior high, high school, my church took us to, I lived in Chicago. So we went to O'Hare Airport back in the day when they weren't all locked down. And we would go around and randomly talk to people about God and Jesus. I was like so embarrassed. I was like, just, dear hole, please open up and drop me into you because I want to disappear. Um, And it was, you know, talking to strangers about God. I'm glad I did it. I mean, it made me pretty fearless. But it was hard. And then along came a bunch of books in the 1990s that said, hey, don't do that. Talk to your friends and neighbors about Christ. And this was called lifestyle evangelism or friendship evangelism. It's a beautiful thing. But along the way, something bad happened. Unfortunately, friendship evangelism morphed into non-evangelism. Because I said earlier that 60% of your unsaved friends are open to a conversation about spiritual things. But that same study also said that 60% of your unsaved friends say they have a Christian friend who rarely or never talks about their faith. This means that lost people, unsaved people, are more interested in hearing a conversation about Jesus than saved people are interested in having that conversation. And I'm not here to make anybody feel guilty, though you should feel horribly guilty over this. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I'm I'm trying to solve the, the problem because... Some of us have friends that, we're a Christian, we've been Christian for years and years and years, and your friends know it, and you have never, this could be 50 years of a friendship, talked about God or Jesus with them, ever. I mean, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, but, but Jesus did these normal conversations. If this works, great. But we also have to have intentional conversations where we're the ones who initiate the conversation to gently bring up spiritual things. So I have a buddy back in Chicago. His name is Steve. He is a big, strong dude. He is uh, 67 years old. He can still do 100 push-ups, still do 100 pull-ups. He is a rock. He's a furniture mover. I saw him move a piano alone upstairs. Okay. And I'm not kidding. Tough guy. 
Um, and I, and I have, I've been in California now for 20 plus years. But back in the day, Steve had this heart to see lost people get saved. He was, I think some people have a spiritual calling or gift of evangelist. That was Steve. Not all of us do. Most of us don't. Um, but that was Steve. Steve would literally go down to like really busy street areas in Chicago where there's like thousands of people going to, bar, going to bars, hanging out, having a good time. And Steve would stand on the corner and he started preaching about Jesus just in the middle of the, of the sidewalk. Uh, and he would actually, this is way back, some of you know about this, he would bring an easel, put a chalkboard on it, it's before marker boards, put a chalkboard on it and do a chalk talk. And write verses and draw pictures to talk to people about Jesus. And he does this because he's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth or something else hanging out of his mouth that he's smoking. And people get saved. This is Steve. Anyway, he kind of fell out of that. This spiritual flame maybe cooled off a little bit. But then last week, we've been talking recently for a while. He's still, he's still in Chicago. Last week, I got a text from him. Hey, Bill, I thought you'd like to know I just led my neighbor Mike to the Lord. Super excited. This is cool. So I call him. I'm on the way to work in the morning. I give him a call. And uh, he's telling me the story. He's like, hey, man, I've just been burdened, and I want to get back into witnessing. So I've got a neighbor. His name is Mike. He's 30 years old. He's a car mechanic. I figure I'm going to go see if he wants to talk about God. And so I grab my Bible. I go over to his apartment. I'm like, hey, Mike, you want to talk about God? And he's like, yes, this would be awesome. See, 60% are open. And so Steve told me what he said. I do not advise what I'm about to say. <laughs> Steve goes to Mike, hey, Mike, I got uh, good news and I got bad news. We're going to do the bad news first. So he said, he said, Bill, I opened my Bible to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 16. Well, if anybody knows that, that's where it talks about the lake of fire and people without Jesus burning in hell. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so Steve, Steve reads that passage of Scripture to Mike, and then he goes, uh, and now Mike, that's the bad news, here's the good news, and he takes him to R Romans 6, 23, which says, the wages of sin is death, which is, you know, the Revelation passage, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord, and so he's telling me this, and, you know, end of the story, he says, yeah, and Mike was super excited, he prayed to receive Jesus, and then he had to go to work, it was really cool, and I'm like, hey, man, in our church, we have a booklet that we give people when they get saved. It's called Welcome to God's Family. You want me to send you some, send you one, and um, you can give it to Mike. He's like, yeah, that'd be awesome. And then he starts telling me, but I want to witness to more of my neighbors, too. Can you send me more than one? I'm like, sure, how many do you want? And so we just sent him last week 30 copies, because this is Steve. He's going to use them all, I tell you. 30 copies of Welcome to God's Family. And we also sent him a case a whole case of New Testaments to also give away. So, uh, which is me saying we need some intentional conversations about faith. And if you keep waiting and waiting for that to come up, it's just not going to happen, you guys. So, in a minute, I'm going to show you an easy way to hit the conversation. So, that's the, the who and the how and now the what. The simplest way, what do you say? The simplest way of witnessing is by sharing the ABCs of the gospel. There are a lot of different formulas for this. Uh, I don't care which one you use. If you've got one that works for you, great. Four spiritual laws, Romans Road, whatever you got. I'm a fan of all of them. But in case you don't have one, here you go. I'm going to give you the ABCs. But first, I think I need to hit the brakes and define the word gospel. Because we hear it a lot. When I'm talking about the gospel in this kind of ta uh, uh, context, here's what the gospel means. When you read or study the Bible and get into theology and all that, there are a lot of topics. There are a lot of truths in the Bible. Thousands of them. Hundreds of thousands of things the Bible teaches us. It's an enormous amount of teaching. We would never say that a person has to understand all of it in order to go to heaven. Because if that's the case, it, it, none of us is going, right? So what is the gospel? The gospel is a specific selection of those truths that a person has to hear and understand in order to be saved. 
When I say the gospel, I mean, here's a, here's a definition. Uh, the gospel is that irreducible subset of biblical truths that a person must hear, believe, and respond to in order to be saved. You don't need to know everything, but you do need to know a few things. It's a subset, and it's irreducible, meaning if you skip one, you don't have the gospel. So this is the gospel. And when we boil it down, I would say that that irreducible subset of biblical truths, there are three of them. That's it, just three. There is a problem that a person must admit. There is a solution to the problem that a person must understand and believe. And there is a response to that solution that a person must choose. Which gives you admit, believe, choose, which is our ABC outline. And this is me saying that when I say the gospel in terms of A, B, and C, which you hear me do all the time, there is a biblical and theological reason for that outline. So one of the tools that I have for you, I said I have two, here's the first one. This little dinky card is the ABCs of the gospel. Here's what it looks like. Here's the front, there's the back. And it's got admit, believe, and choose and some scriptures on the front. And then it's got um, a prayer to pray on the back. And bonus, it's really small. You can carry it in your pocket, your wallet, your purse, put one in your glove box, whatever. And we have made enough so that everybody in our church can take one today. Do not take two. <laughs> Only take one. And if you're sitting here thinking, I know somebody who should have one, but they're not here today. That's too bad for them, isn't it? <laughs> Seriously, just take one. I am not trying to be mean, but I do have my reasons. And I will tell you that if you actually use this card in a conversation, who knows, this, this, this next weekend's Easter. There's an openness. We've had some really sad events in our community and in our church and some, some losses and some funerals. And there's an, people are looking for answers. Maybe you can use this card in a conversation this week. And if you do, you can give the card to that person. And then next time you're here, you can come back and get two more cards. See how that works? Now, here's a simple way. If you've got this card... And a conversation comes up, it's about whatever it's about, and it might start leading into something spiritual or God or heaven. You just ask this question. Have you ever heard the ABCs of the gospel? If you could just say, have you ever heard the ABCs of the gospel? Or you might want to use the word, have you ever, the word good news, which is what gospel means. Have you ever heard the ABCs of the good news? And unless they've been in a pathway, they're going to say no. And then, then, and then you go, Whoa. You are ready to rock and roll. Because this is how you open an intentional conversation about the gospel. Now, I need to say something here that's very important. We are to never be pushy about the gospel or Jesus. You're only going to make it harder for people to come after you. We, do not be a bully. Do not be coercive. Do not be insistent. Do not be pushy. In the study of how the gospel flows and missionaries and all of that, this is a field called missiology. There's a very important principle that applies here. The principle is hold resistant fields lightly. And what that means is that where missionaries or Christians or anybody are working in a place where the people are resistant, then what you should do is back off. This is what I'm telling you to do. Back off. Keep a light touch, a light present in their lives, but back off. Don't abandon them. Don't cut off the friendship. Let God work on them. He will. They're not ready because they're not willing to be ready, so don't push. So if you, if you say, hey, have you heard the ABCs of the gospel, and you sense resistance, man, I'm not interested, and nah, I don't talk, just back off. Don't push into it. Just back off. And what you, when they say, no, nah, I'm not really interested, you say, how about them bears? first round draft pick coming up. I mean, just change the subject. All right? So, um, and then you can follow up. Hey, man, if you're ever open to a conversation like that, 
I'm here for you. That'll be cool. Now, what are the ABCs of the gospel? So these are the ABCs of the gospel. A stands for admit. You have a, a problem you need to admit. I have broken God's laws and I need forgiveness from him. Now, the word for this is the word sin, but I'm going to advise you to not lead off with the word sin. And no, I'm not being soft on sin. I'm trying to be strong on communication. Because when we use the word sin, it's been so greatly misunderstood. It's become such a negative that what we mean by it is one thing, but what people who are like not familiar with the term hear is something else. And now you're on like two different wavelengths and the communication is messed up from the beginning. So I like to use much more meaningful language. I've broken God's laws. I've not lived up to God's standards. We don't even live up to our own standards, so nobody's going to argue with you when you say you haven't lived up to God's standards. So, and the scriptures do talk about sin. I'm not afraid of that word, but I wouldn't start with that word. Like, you sinner, you're a sinner and you need a savior. I used to talk like that. Now I would just soften that because I don't want to want people to shut down right away. Uh, So on the card, there is a Bible verse which says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then uh, there's only one Bible verse, but there's a reference for Ecclesiastes 7.20, which you could open your phone and show them. There's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. And also there's a reference for Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And you just, just share this, explain it. And don't get into an argument. Let the Bible make the case. So the Bible starts, hey, man, you've got something to admit, which is that we are essentially rebels against the moral order of God's universe. We've all said to God, take a hike one way or another. And you guys, there is a line right down the middle of the human race. On one side of the line are people who are saved. On the other side of the line are people who are not saved. To be saved, to be on that side of the line, means that a person has deliberately, consciously, on purpose, made it official and tied the knot of a relationship with God. And if a person has not done that, they're on the other side of the line. There's no gray area here. It's just crystal clear. You're saved or you're not saved. It's kind of like being born or not yet born. No one's kind of born. And if they're on the unsaved side of the line, the story of their lives can be very beautiful and awesome. They can be really cool and fun and lovely people. But the whole story of their lives is overshadowed by a gigantic, unaccepted invitation from God Almighty to be saved. And that's the next thing for them. You cannot blur that line. And you want to get people to a point of admitting that they need God, and they don't have it. Then B stands for believe. And the essence of this is that Jesus died on the cross for me so I could be forgiven. We had a, a mom this week, I tell you, we've got tons of stories, um, who was talking to Pastor Josh, and um, she's walking across, she's here at church, she's walking from one of the buildings to one of the other buildings across our campus And she's with her young daughter, and her daughter's asking questions about salvation. And the mom is explaining to her little girl how much God loves you and God cares for you and all of this. And she actually said, the mom said that she was kind of trying to avoid the heavy stuff about Jesus dying and suffering. And as she's talking, her daughter's just not satisfied. The daughter knew that something's missing. And so she kept pressing her mom. And hitting her up with questions, and finally the mom said that she realized that the Holy Spirit was telling her she needed to explain that Jesus died on the cross for her daughter to bring her back to God. And she did that, and right away, that's when the lights came on for her little girl, and her little girl prayed to receive Jesus Christ as her Savior, walking right over there. Which is to say, this is super important, there's no such thing as a crossless gospel. You can't skip the cross. This is irreducible, right? You cannot skip skip the cross. The cross of the Christ, if it's not the centerpiece of your communication, then whatever you're saying is not the gospel. You have to talk about Jesus dying. And the Bible uses different language for this. There's the cross, there's the blood of Christ, there's the crucifixion, the sacrifice, his death, his substitutionary death, 
His payment for our sins, all of that, however you say it. You know what the Bible says? Five words, one syllable. Christ died for our sins. That is the gospel. It says so in 1 Corinthians 15. Here is the gospel. Christ died for our sins. And if you skip that part, you're not getting the gospel. It drives me crazy when I hear someone say, hey, receive Jesus, man. He loves you. Okay, great. That's cool. Keep going. And, and, he died for your sins. You've got to get that part in there. And so the scriptures that are on the card, you've got Ephesians 1, 7, which says, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. There it is. And forgave our sins. And then there's just the reference for Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to clean yourself up. Jesus loved you when you were still a sinner, and he died for you then, all right? So we have something to admit. We have something to believe, which is that Jesus died to bring me back to God. Now we have a choice to make, and that's what the C stands for, to put my faith in Jesus and receive him as my Savior, okay? And this is all over Scripture, but we are saved by faith. And the heart and soul of faith is making a choice to believe. So John 3.16, that's on the card. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believe. Say yes. Right? Um, and there's a reference. By reference, I just mean it says John 1.12. It doesn't have the rest of it. That's called the reference. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So when you receive Jesus, you become a child of God. How do you receive Jesus? To those who believe on his name. Same thing. These things are like different ways of saying the same thing. You guys, it's faith. It's not good works. It's faith, not getting religious. It's faith, not stopping your sins. You don't tell somebody, hey, you got to stop doing it. You got to stop living with her. You got to stop sleeping with him. No. I mean, maybe they need to, but that's not how they get saved. And that's not a prerequisite for them to get saved. God saves people while they're still messed up, okay? Or look at you. Jeez. <laughs> it's faith, not giving God anything. It's faith, not baptism, confirmation, confession, communion, all good things. But that's not how you get saved. It's faith, not human effort, human performance, human anything. The issue here is faith in Christ as your Savior and your only hope to rest the weight of your confidence on him. If I were to die today and stand before God and God were to say, hey, Bill, why should I let you into heaven? I am not pointing to anything I have done. I'm going to look around and see where's Jesus. There he is. I'm going to point to him. I'm going to say, he's the reason he died for me and he rose again. And if that ain't enough, I've got no plan B. It, my, all my reason is Christ. That's what faith means, to rest the weight of your confidence on him. And people say, well, I, faith is hard. I have trust issues, which I understand. But in this case, no. Everybody has faith. You've got faith. Every human being has faith. Faith is easy. We're born believers. We're natural born faith people. Faith is effortless. It's the most automatic response of the human spirit. The problem with an, an unsaved person is not a lack of faith. They've got plenty of faith. The problem is that their faith is pointing to the wrong thing or to themselves. Why should I let you into heaven? God says, because I'm a good person. Your faith is in the wrong thing. Trust me on this one. When we share the gospel, we are using the power of the Bible to help lost people redirect their faith from wherever it is today to Jesus Christ who died for their sins and rose again. That's all it is. And I am telling you that if you pull out this card or any tool you've got and you explain these ABCs with anybody, the Holy Spirit rushes into that situation. The Holy Spirit is right there with you working in and upon that person and strengthening you because wherever the gospel goes, the Spirit of God goes too. And if you want to see the Holy Spirit at work, share the gospel. You will see the miracle of new birth. And I have to say, I do not tell anybody to ask Jesus into their heart. I think that language, beside not being in the Bible, it's too metaphorical. It doesn't make sense. It's confusing. And people picture a little G.I. Jesus in their 
thing that pump, pumps blood. It doesn't make sense. I don't use that language. I do not like to tell anybody to commit their life to Christ or to give their life to Christ because that reverses the whole truth here as if our commitment can save us. I'm, how good are you at commitment? I'm like, come on. I can't even commit to a diet. <laughs> so it's not my commitment that's going to save me. You want to see commitment? Look at Jesus dying on the cross. That is commitment. And that's what saves me. Ditto for giving your life to God. What do you mean give your life to God? Jesus gave his life on the cross so he could give a life to you. You're dead spiritually. You got nothing to give. However, saying this, like, don't, I don't want anybody to get so freaked out that you're going to say it wrong that you just say, oh, forget it. I'm not going to do it. Because honestly, I don't care what you say. If you got the cross in there and you invite a person to respond right then and there, God's going to save them even if you got the words wrong. So don't just shut down on this. It's as if every day you've got a friend, a family member, a coworker, a guy on the team with you, a gal on the team. God is holding out a gift to that person, and God is saying to them, I will forgive you if you only believe in Jesus as your Savior. I will adopt you in my, into my forever family if you'll only believe. I will robe you in the goodness of Christ, counting his goodness as if it were yours, if you'll only believe. I will build a mansion for you in heaven. I will accept you just as you are. I will come and live inside you. I will make you the person you dream of becoming, but you think it's out of reach, if you'll only believe. I will fill you with my love, my peace, my joy, if you'll only believe. I will give you eternal life, if you will only believe, I will protect you as my own precious child. I will walk with you in dark times. I will set a feast before you in troubled times. I will defend you in perilous times, celebrate with you in good times, and bring you to heaven at the end of time, if you will only believe. What a gift. We have the best thing in the world. Do not shy away from offering it. Anybody in their right mind would want this. Sometimes people will object. Really? Only believe? That's too easy. When they say that, that's how you know you did it right. Yeah, it's easy for you because it was so hard for Jesus on the cross. So now you have explained the ABCs of the gospel. Now it's time to tie the knot. And this is when you say to them, so would you like to do this? Would you like to pray this prayer? Or would you like to make it official? The words don't matter. But you want to do this right here, right now. And if they say yes, you move on. We're going to do this. If they say no or express hesitancy, you have not failed. That's okay. And, and the reason why you have not failed is because people finally get saved by being nudged closer and closer to Jesus. And there's a conversation here or someone witnesses to them or later and then they read a book or they hear a sermon and then another conversation. You're just one of many nudges when finally they get saved and you're bringing them closer to Jesus. It's not a failure if they don't get saved. So go for it. So there's a sample prayer on this card and you can have them pray it. There's admit, believe, and choose. And so I, what I like to do, I think you can get them to pray it out loud. That's the most concrete, awesomest way to do it. But what I like to do is give them one line at a time and have them repeat it back. So we're going to practice that. I'm going to do that. We're going to do it right here, right now. We're going to have everybody pray out loud. Everybody pray out loud. Don't be a rebel or a sinner or evil. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be too cool. I mean, just do it, okay? We're going to have everybody pray out loud. Um, and I'll just say, because we all, I want to practice this, but also, if you've never prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior, you pray out loud too, and this counts for you, and you will get saved right here, right now. And you know, you got cover because we're all doing it. It's not like you're like, oh, I got, you know. So let's all do it, okay? You with me? The first two services, so this is our fourth church service, if, you, if you're wondering, of the weekend. The other guys are pretty great. <laughs> I'm just saying the bar is high. So I'll say it, then you say it. Here we go. God, I admit I have broken your laws. God, I admit I have yeah. Laws. And have disobeyed you. I have sinned. And I need forgiveness from you. Okay, then B stands for believe. God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. For me. I believe you punished him for my sins. Instead of, me, Instead of punishing me, 
You guys are fading a little bit. <laughs> and I thank you. And I thank you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Jesus alone can bring me back to you. I believe, Lord. I believe, Lord. So? so? Now we go to choose. God, right now I choose, God, right now, I choose. To, believe Jesus, to believe in Jesus as my Savior, as my Savior. And, only hope. and only hope. I officially receive Jesus, I officially receive Jesus. And, the gift of salvation he brings. and the gift of salvation he brings. Because of him, because of him. I'm asking you, Please save me, me. forgive me, me. and make me your child forever. And And then what do we say? Yeah, come on now, give yourself a hand. This is awesome. Well done. If you just got saved, welcome to God's family. That is so cool. Now, I said we have two tools. Uh, The first tool is this card. Uh, and like I said, we have one for everybody. The second tool is this little book that is called Welcome to God's Family. And uh, we give this every time someone gets saved, this is our gift to you. Now, I have to say this book that has become really popular and a lot of people, I'll show you the picture of it. <clears throat> there it is. And every uh, Christmas and Easter, so Easter's next week, we have, make a special cover for it, but it's the same book. Um, we have a lot of people who like to take this book. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, you cannot. This is not a free-for-all. This is only for a person who just received Jesus as your Savior. We actually have people who have been trying to collect all the different covers as souvenirs. (laughs) Church people. Holy cow. (laughs) Please don't, uh, because we actually do pay for these books. It costs us money. We're super happy to give them as a gift to everybody who receives Jesus. Um, If you want your own copy, they're on Amazon. Go get one. Um, But, I mean, if you just got saved, we are happy to give this to you. And here's the deal. If you use this card or anything to lead somebody to Jesus, give them the card and say to them, I'm going to get a booklet for you next time I see you. Then, next time you come to church, you go to the hub or the prayer team and say, I need a welcome to God's family because I just led a friend to Christ. And then you get one. So the hub is a table, a desk out in the lobby there. Um, We'll give you one totally free. And now you have a reason to go back to your friend and continue the conversation. You give them the book, there's a place to sign and date it on the back, and offer, hey, you want to just read it, or how about we go through it over coffee over the next few weeks, or whatever. Uh, and, and you now get to get two more of these cards. <laughs> it's complicated, but don't worry, we'll walk you through. Last week, I talked about you stepping up to your hero's journey. This is it. Go be somebody's hero. Amen. Amen. God, I pray for thousands of heroes to walk out these doors with kindness and patience and grace, no pushing, no bulliness, but just a gentle way of loving their friends and family and fellow teammates enough to tell them about the best friend and the only Savior and the best news and the best deal anyone can ever get, salvation in Jesus Christ, our Savior. In whose name we pray, and all God's people can say, amen. Amen. All right.